We welcome everybody to the last last uh, Tuesday self-directed webinar of the year, final one. Um, thank you guys all for being here today. The I see the the numbers are still increasing. Looks like we still have some people joining in, so we'll we'll give it a little bit more. Um, hope everybody had a great Christmas, great holiday weekend, um, regardless of what you celebrate, right? So uh, yeah, I hope. Um, I hope everybody's Christmas was good. Hope you got to spend time with friends and family and, um, you know, do whatever it is you do, whatever it is you celebrate. Um, while we are waiting for just a little bit longer, um, I do want to mention that throughout the webinar, you can ask our presenter questions. Um, if you'll just type them down in the comment section, uh, we will go ahead and get those questions answered for you. So. Um, without any further ado, I am going to go ahead and do a little introduction. So for those of you that don't know me, you know, I've, I've been on here a few times and, and done several different quests, presentations and things like that. But uh, my name is Colin Taylor. I am one of the IRA specialists here at Quest. Um, and so today we are going to be talking about how to start a fund or launch your own fund with Chris Carsley. So um First thing that we always kind of have to disclaim um, and, and discuss, we always have some new faces, some familiar faces, but for those people that are new, uh, Quest and by extension myself and our presenter, we are not here to give any tax, legal or investment advice. So really, as you go through this presentation, please keep in mind that this is purely for educational purposes to help you expand your knowledge, um, but not really to give any sort of type of advice, okay? So a little bit about who is Quest. Like I mentioned, you know, we always do have some new people on here, um, but Quest is one of the largest self-directed IRA custodians in the state of Texas. We do have three offices here in Texas, one in Houston, one in Dallas, and one in Austin. Um, and we have over 20,000 different active investors across the country. So not just in the state of Texas, but we have uh, clients all across the U.S. We've got a little over two billion, and actually it's closer to about 2.6 billion in assets under administration now, um, getting close to 2.7, I believe. And then 100 employees, probably closer to um, 110, with about 34 having that certified IRA services professional designation um, or the CISP designation. And that's a that's a pretty lengthy and rigorous training course that you have to go through as well as tests that you have to take a several hour test that you have to take and obviously pass to get that CISP certification. So it's pretty rigorous um, and, and a tough accomplishment to get. Um, I'm, I'm still working towards mine currently hoping to take the CISP exam next year. But uh, moving on, we have about $400 million in undirected cash, meaning that our clients are looking for deals. You know, they're looking for investments to make. And that's why we bring these presentations to you guys. Um, so that you can kind of hear different speakers and hear different opportunities and things like that and kind of decide what is best for you to do with your money, right? So education is obviously key. That's why we do these types of things, right? Um, I, I can't say it enough. You know, I think that education is very important and these webinars are, are super important to help you guys understand and expand your knowledge. Knowledge is key, knowledge is wealth. So we do... Um, Put all these all these uh, videos up on our YouTube, on our Facebook. I'm sure you're watching live from one of those platforms right now. But we also post the recordings on there. So I'll talk about that here in just a second. But these are the classes we do have um, that we host regularly. Every So actually, Tuesday, we are discontinuing for next year. But moving forward, every Saturday, 12 p.m. Central Time, we do have a brand new um, and, and with a completely different speaker, a new self-directed, what we call our self-directed IRA Saturday classes. So um, look out for those. You can always register online on our website, um, which our lovely moderator, Brianna Clayton, she will be posting the links. You can see the comments from her already. Um, and, and she'll be putting those links in there too. So you can access the website, access these webinars and things like that on our, on our, um, on our website. Something else we do is what we call our virtual networking happy hour. We do this on the fourth Wednesday of every month. Um, and actually, it's been a little bit weird the past couple months just with Thanksgiving and Christmas going on. So we have done them earlier this year. But um, starting in the new year, we will get back to the, our regular schedule. So if you have been a part of those or are interested in being a part of those, it's really 
um, for our clients across the country to be able to get on, network and socialize with other investors, other like-minded individuals, um, and hear about different deals and different opportunities and, and even pitch their own deals, right? Get to know other people. So those are I think those are a really, really great resource, especially for those who are just trying to build their network up. Um, but like I said before, um, check out our YouTube and Facebook. And I, I believe Brianna will include those links as well or may have already. Um, yeah. Yeah. Here's where you can register online on our website. But check out our YouTube and Facebook. It has all of the previously recorded webinars that we've done um, posted on there. So... Without any further ado, the last thing that I do want to say is that if you do need to get in touch with myself, get in touch with one of our other IRA specialists, you know, me, Brianna, anyone else that's here, we can certainly help you. Um, please use the live chat feature on our website. That's, you know, manually operated by me or one of the other IRA specialists from 830 to 530 Central Time, Monday through Friday. We will have somebody on there to answer your questions. You can call us at the number there you see. Um, I included my email there, and then I'm sure Brianna will put both of our emails in there for you guys to reach out to us. So, yeah, that's um, really all that I have. So I want to go ahead and bring up our speaker for the day. I'm, I'm really excited for this presentation. Um, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I, I'm really looking forward to it and know we're, we're having a we're going to have a great turnout and I think a, a great presentation. So I'll, I'll kind of let you take it away. Well, hey, Colin, thanks. Thanks for having us. And hey, everyone that can actually join us for this. Uh, I appreciate you uh, taking the time. I know it's a busy time and I know there's a lot of people that uh, will probably watch this video later. So I want to make sure that, uh, yes, as he, Colin said, it'll be available on YouTube. And if anyone wants the deck, that's certainly available as well. Uh, I know that's a common question at the end of this is, can I get the deck? Most certainly you can. Um, you can reach out to Quest or myself um, to obtain that deck. Uh, it's uh, something that I have no problem sharing. So let's dive into why we're talking about this. This has been something I've seen on a ton of different chats. Uh, this year has been difficult. There has been a dynamic shift for a lot of people, regardless of what investment you are involved in. But what we are seeing now is it is maybe perhaps more difficult to raise money or you have had success and this is now your time to think about, should I build a fund? Um, but I'm also going to walk through and talk a little bit about some of the nuances you need to think about when you're going to go down this venture. Uh, it is not as simple as uh, some people might want to make it sound. Um, it is a fair amount of work. And as was said earlier, I'm not going to talk about legal structures or exemptions, what you should do given your investment. Um, that's not what this is about. This is an intro seminar into, hey, let's think about and break down a lot of the things you have to be going into when you are talking uh, about building your own fund uh, and some of what that really means to have your own fund. So let's jump to the next slide. Oh, God. Well, we can we can skip over this, but I will say uh, one thing real quick is I started my career in uh, the investment management world, uh, was very fortunate enough to be able to be invited and to come in and work with uh, a hedge fund. And part of that, part of my job, other than sitting in a desk doing trades, was I got to work with a number of different funds within that, uh, that shop because um, there's lots of different trading strategies. And I was part of a group that got to go around and enhance efficiencies and operations and look at all the different trade strategies and figure out how were we going to best build um, these you know, the funds and the structures that these uh, funds were going to sit on. So that was my first intro into hey, how does this all work and why would we do this and how do we build this? I took that and then went to work for a fund of fund and they had a great investment due diligence platform. And I was part of a team that was then going to expand that investment due diligence team to operate and sort of look at business operations and operational due diligence and how that can create efficiencies or hindrances with regards to the investment platform you're going to create. And then when I left the fund to fund, I obviously went in and started building some of my own funds across a number of different structures, managed futures, um, seed and angel and venture, um, built uh, a couple different and helped people think about long, short uh, equity hedge fund structures. And then obviously I built my own funds, you know, in, you know, real estate debt, which I currently run right now. 
Um, so let's uh, we can we can move on from that guy. Uh, let's go to the important meat of why everyone's here to uh, to talk. The agenda today is well, why? Why 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 do you want to do this? Um, second is going in and saying, hey, let's identify what your investment is. Um, some of you may uh, hopefully have that identified or you're still forming that idea. Uh, think of that as your product. Next is team. Um, very, very important. And I'll, I'll say we've got a lot of meat to talk on that section. So we'll save it for that slide. And then you got to build two things. A lot of people think, hey, I'm just going to go build one entity. Like I'm going to build one company that's going to create a widget. A fund is a little bit more complicated than that because you've got two entities you have to build when you're thinking about building a fund. You've got to build the manager, which is where all the people work, and the people who control the fund. The fund is the entity that actually holds the investments in the name of the investors that you're going to go get uh, for your investment. Um, so we'll, we'll dive into those two pieces. Um, and not surprisingly, the building the fund is a little bit more complicated. And, you know, the, there's lots of things to think about there. So we'll dive into that. And then I'll end with a final slide of, you know, just some points and sort of reiterations of some of the things we're going to talk about on challenges and opportunities of why we're doing this, why we built a fund. Let's move on. First says, why? Do you really want to be an investment manager? And I ask this question because I meet a lot of people and it doesn't matter. You could be, uh, I got a, a great uh, special situations trade or, hey, I've, I've been doing real estate syndications or, oh, I've, I've traded options and volatility. I irrelevant of the strategy, you have to understand being a manager and building a fund is building a business. And there's everything that goes into building that business is not all about the investment. And I have met a lot of managers. You can tell they love the investing. They love putting the trade in. They love the wins, but they don't want to run the business. And so we'll talk about some of the ways that kind of person can still run and function at a, at a fund. But you got to ask yourself, do you really want to be an investment manager? Um, some of you will say yes. Uh, some of you will honestly probably say, wow, no, I don't, I don't really want to do this. And maybe there's a, a different structure I should think about. Or uh, if I don't already have a team that helps with my investment, maybe I should think about building that team. Um, and what are you trying to achieve? And some of this is a little tongue in cheek, but don't laugh. I've actually run into people who built funds for the very wrong reason is, you know, maybe in today's world, I hear a lot of I want to go build a fund because I'm having trouble raising money for my one off uh, structures that I'm doing. Okay, that that's someone who just doesn't understand what a fund is. Um, if you have a trouble raising money for your one off structures, how is that going to change when you need to raise money for your fund? That really doesn't change. Um, anyone tells you that raising money for a fund is somehow easier, um, you should probably check their pedigree. Either they're really, really good at raising money, they've done it a lot, or they don't understand how hard it is to raise money for a fund. Um, secondly is, you know, is it a better way to offer your investment vehicle? And that's the really key one. That's one you want to say yes to. That's the one where it's like, hey, I'm going to build this fund because, you know, it's going to create an, a platform for investors to come in, whether they be large or small, depending on accredited level. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and this is going to be a more cost effective platform for investors to come in and access my unique investment that I've created. That's that's what you want to really be able to say. This is why I'm doing this. And don't laugh. The last one there is not just for fun i have literally had tell people tell me well i want to be able to create a fund so that i can charge an incentive fee or something of structure or make more money in my opinion that is the wrong reason um <laughs> but everyone has their motivations um so if if you're in, in my opinion if your answer is number two there of like hey this is this is a superior way to bring a great investment to a larger pool of investors then yeah maybe we're on the right track of you should be building a fund um, if it's not, well, you're, you might be successful, but you're probably in for a slightly tougher road. Let's, uh, let's, uh, jump forward here. Uh, next slide. All right. So we've kind of died, dove in a little bit of why we're doing this. And, and we have some questions to think about at that level. Let's think about what's our investment. Well, our, th we're building a company. A fund is a company and a company provides a product. And the product is whatever investment you have been doing or want to do on the fund platform. 
you need to first identify what is this investment? You know, and what's what is this objective that you're going to try and create? You know, is this objective I'm going to create uh, through my investment income, uh, equity growth? Uh, perhaps I'm doing some vol trading. So I'm going to be doing something what they call counter cyclical, where it's like, hey, I can trade vol. And, you know, when the market goes down, I actually make money and I can be a great uh, vehicle for people to access, you know, an offset to their portfolio as everything else is suffering. I'm doing well. Um, so it's a good diversifier. Figure out what your objective is. Why are you building this? And how does that relate to your investment? Um, and, and merge those two ideas. Um, next is your strategy. Okay, now you've got an objective. You understand, hey, this is my investment. This is why I'm building this. Is the, this is the objective of the fund. Why investors would consider this. Now, how am I going to pull it off? What's my strategy? You know, uh, you know. What's my inefficiency is you'll hear me say that word repeatedly is, is my investment product in an inefficient space and is it repeatable? Do I have access to, you know, let's uh, use one of the examples I have. I don't know if we lost our deck or not. Um, Colin. Hello. Did we lose? Our connection. I just lost view of the deck. Oh, I'm going to continue. Looks like we're still going live here. So, you know, in that strategy section, um, you know, we've got, you know, like I was saying, that inefficiency, is it repeatable? You already know your investment product. You know what you're going to trade. What are you going to trade to create that objective and create it consistently in this fund structure? That's what's going to be really, really important. Um, you know, I'm a little worried that I'm going to talking to myself here. <clears throat> hmm. I just lost everybody. Uh, okay. Well, it still says we're live. I'm not getting anything in chat. Um, Hmm. All right. Well, I'm not getting anyone in chat. It says I'm still live and we're in the show. So hopefully this will still work. I'll continue to go forward with my uh, presentation and hopefully this works or we'll have to reschedule. Um, so now that we've walked through what the investment is, we understand the investment and you know the strategy that you're going to say. You got to identify that. I mean, this is the first step. You got to identify what your product is. That product is going to move forward, and you're going to, you know, be able to continually repeat that on this fun platform. You know, you maybe you did this as an individual one-off trade, and now you're going to have, hey, it is repeatable, and I want to be able to create a portfolio of these. You know, maybe that's the reason you're going to create a fund. Um, so. You know, next slide, and I hope you guys can see this. I've got my slide deck up just in case something like this happens, is um, team. All right, well, this is super important. This is where things can make or break. Um, you can run into a situation of where, <clears throat> all right, we got Colin Taylor is on and stream only. Hey, yeah, uh, Chris, can you hear us? Yeah. So uh, for some reason, the internet across our entire office just went down. Um, oh okay yeah so i i'm currently on my f <laughs> sorry everybody i'm currently on my phone right now uh we're running into some technical difficulties hoping to have it back up soon yeah chris if you just want to keep going um yeah we'll i mean i can i can keep now. talking and you know obviously we can supply i've got the deck up and everything else i mean we can keep talking so okay not it, should, it should just be a couple minutes so 
No, no, no problem. I mean, we just uh, we just uh, closed up with uh, the investment slide, and I'll talk a little bit about team, and hopefully we'll uh, get things back up and running. Perfect. Okay. Um, all right, team. Uh, as I was saying, uh, that was uh, it's uh, probably the most important aspect. Uh, I assume if you're thinking about building a fund, you've already kind of gone through what we just talked about. What well, what is my investment? What's my objective that I want to create through this fund? And what's my strategy to take this inefficient trade that's going to create excess returns and investors are going to want to be a part of it and I can make it repeatable. Um, so, so moving on to team, you know, we'll have, uh, I mean, I don't know if you can, Colin, if you can move the slide forward. I mean, as I see it back up and running now. Hey, there we go. Um, first is, you know, as I said earlier on the investment side, a word you'll hear if you watch any of my webinars, I'll talk about inefficiencies. Um, you got to have an inefficient trade if you're going to create an excess return on a repeatable basis. Um, it's just the way the world works. If someone can prove to me that it can be done, you know, through capturing market level returns, create an excess return. Well, I'd love to hear about that. But on the other side is that team is the edge. What is the team bringing? that creates a unique edge of why these people are going to be able to carry out that investment objective and eventually the strategy on an ongoing basis is something as you go into and maybe you already have a team um, but if you don't have a team and you're putting together a trade with a new team this is something you're going to have to really identify and here's a, on this slide there's a number of different factors that you can go in and consider um, you should go in and do background checks I don't care if you think you know people or not. Um, you can have great conversations, you can build friendships, but you may not know the longevity and the background of these people that you're about to go into business with. I really suggest you get background checks on all of the employees, everyone who's gonna be part of this manager and fund. Um, <clears throat> next, I love this. Um, I was never a fan of personality tests. Um, I think it's important in, in today's world because there's a number of different dynamics and you'll see how it plays into some of the other points is have a personality test run on the people who are going to be part of your team. Understand how they think about things, how they are in their personal time, how they are at work. I have found one, it's beneficial for me to assess uh, how I look at and, and deal with certain structures and also your other teammates. And it's not like you're not trying to assess are they good or bad? What you're trying to assess in a personality test is how do you best work together? Because in any business that you're going to create, there's going to be tough times. There's going to be some problems that will occur. How is that person most likely going to react in those difficult and stressful times? And how do you best work with that person? Uh, and I'm assuming you're the one building the funds so or you're the lead manager. You might be the chief investment officer or something like that uh, or the CEO of the structure. So this is sort of driven at you sort of manage this an entire team in this fund that's going to carry out, you know, your strategy. Um, does do any of these people or yourself have an individual track record? Um, even if it doesn't directly pertain to the investment that you're building within this fund, sometimes showing previous success. Um, and also that background of, hey, I've been a successful manager without having any problems occur. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that run into all kinds of different securities, legal issues. You know, that'll come up in the background test, but it's also uh, a consistent track record of saying, hey, you know, maybe this person hasn't printed billions of dollars, but they've been quite successful throughout their career and maybe a number of different platforms and, you know, had no problems. Um, that's, an, that's another track record that in the investment world, I think is fairly important. You know, a lot of people home in on like, well, how much money did you print? What's your numbers? I also like to look at it as like, well, do I have a team of people that haven't had any problems for their entire career, especially if they've been doing it 20, 30 years? Um, resumes and bios, get those on hand. Um, it's one of those things that you're going to need. Um, it's one you should understand. How do people think about themselves when they write it down on paper? Um, and then you'll have to create a bio of saying, hey, how do I take their past bio and then translate that into something that's going to be more pertained to the fund that you're building? Because it will be something that people ask for. People are going to want to understand and dive into in their due diligence process. They're going to want to go through and think about, well, who, who are these team members? You know, how do they identify themselves? Um, references. 
you know, get some references on your team members, um, especially if it's someone you don't really know that well. Go figure out who they've worked with, um, you know, maybe a past client. Um, there's a lot of different ways to look at references. Um, sometimes you can go onto LinkedIn and maybe if there's a, you have a common link, you can reach out to the person and say, hey, how do you know this person? I know sometimes people in today's age of the, the marketing through LinkedIn, it may not always work out to go that route <clears throat> to find references, but sometimes it will. Um, and lastly, uh, what I found is useful, and I don't get full credit for this because my current partner and my current fund that we're running, um, he came from big corporate world. And so they developed what's called a RACI. Now, you know, a RACI is a responsibilities and assignments matrix is really what it is. Have people think about what are they doing for the company? What's their core? What are they responsible for? What are they assigned to? What are they going to be included on? Or are they just kind of aware of that situation or they don't even need to be aware of uh, certain tasks within the fund? Identify that ahead of time. So people understand when, hey, we're going to come together, we're going to create this company. People understand what they're supposed to do day one. I know it sounds, well, that sounds like common sense, Chris, but you'd be amazed. I've been a part of a lot of organizations that haven't done that. Uh, and when you actually go through that process, uh, it, it's it's enlightening in a lot of ways. So if you're going to build this fund and you're going to want your team to start off on the right foot, try to identify as much as possible. Um, and, you know, make sure you're working with the right people. You understand how they operate, what kind of person they are, and, you know, what they're going to be doing, you know, when they're here. Um, now everyone always, when you come into a smaller fund, per se, um, and someone might have multiple jobs that they have to do, you still want to identify their core, core competence set. So this is an important slide. Um, one of the key notes I want to make here is, you know, most people think a fund blows up because it was some kind of fraud or the investment didn't work. Um, they have enough data now over decades that most failures of funds actually occur due to team and operational problems rather than the investment failure or a fraud. Um, so that's something to note. And that's why I really want to highlight this slide in particular is understand who you're putting together um, because they're the ones that have a high probability of creating your success or your failure in, in your fund, uh, in the fund that you're going to create. So uh, let's move on. Um, Next slide. Yeah. Uh, real quick, Chris, we do have a couple questions. Yeah. And I also yeah. just wanted to say, appreciate you and everybody listening in for your patience. Uh, <laughs> that was a little unexpected. But um, we have a couple questions here from Stephen. So number one, what are the legal costs to set it up correctly? And I'm not sure if he's referring to the company, like the entity or holistically or, or what. Uh, yeah, we'll get we'll get into that. Um, we'll, we'll answer that. I. I'm not going to give you a number because it's it's it depends on what you're creating. Um, that's a deeper conversation. Um, you can create a fund for very little if you actually have the knowledge set to create a lot of the things that I'm about to talk. Because uh, we're gonna we're gonna walk through the next couple of slides. They're gonna talk about well, okay, now you've made all these decisions and you've got your team and you've got your objective and you've got your strategy and you think you've got you know you got the right mentality to build the fund. Um, now you got to go build the manager in the fund. And so we can jump from the next slide, but um, there is no one number. There are strategies that are super complex and they require a lot of um, legal structuring uh, to be put in place. And obviously anytime something is more complex, it's going to cost more money because you're going to have uh, you know, not only the legal docs that we'll talk about, but perhaps some esoteric, you know, legal docs in, in particular and some particular language that matches your investment. Um, you know, there's a lot of people out there that will go create. And this is something I mean, I'll, I'll throw it out there is anywhere from 10,000 to 50,000 is, is a very wide range of saying, OK, I can build your entire doc set. That's some of the documents we'll talk about. Um, but it also requires like, well, the complexity of filing. Um, some filing is very simple um, and some filing, depending on there again, on your investment structure uh, can be more complex um, depending on, <clears throat> you know, federal and state regulations. Um, so there's no one answer to that question of like what it costs. Um, 
but I can give you give you kind of a range. Um, and we had a second question. Yeah, that one, I, I I was wondering if you could maybe make more sense of it than I could. Uh, what are your team members' you names that go to events for you? Sounds like so he's been there for a year, came from Ohio. Oh, um, well, it depends on which event. Um, you know, for my current fund in in debt, you know, if I have the bandwidth and capability to make it to some of those events, I certainly will because it's important to understand all the moving pieces of the fund that you're going to be involved in. Um, but if it's something lender related where, you know, we have to source uh, a number of loans, well, we'll send our underwriting team, the people who deal with that directly and deal directly with, um, you know, our, our, our loan brokers and our borrowers. Um, if it's something more investment related um, or something investor related, uh, well, then, you know, being the chief investment officer, uh, you know, I'll definitely go. Um, it's important to be, you know, the face of your fund. Now, if you have you're lucky enough to create a fund and say, hey, I'm going to be a rollout and someone's going to write me 500 million day one and I'm going to have a team of 50 people. Um, well, OK, that's a whole different scenario. You might have a whole division of people that go to certain events, depending on your investment. Um, you, you may send certain people in one direction and you, you may have a compliance division. You may have uh, internal accounting. So they might go to fund administration conferences and things like that. It, it gets very complex depending on the size and what you're actually thinking about building and the size of your team. Um, for me, I've always been relatively small and you have smaller teams. Um, so I find upper management very involved in a variety of different uh, events um, as we try to, you, you know, stay up the curve on, on on a number of different things that, you know, just because you build one of these things, it's just like a company. There's a lot of ongoing maintenance and you got to keep up as perhaps regulations or rules or taxes change. Um, so uh, I hope that answers your question. Um, but some of that we're going to dive into the next slide. So if we want to move forward, um, yep. we'll talk about building the first of the two companies, which is the manager. Um, so and some of these questions, some of the questions you had there, um, this will pertain to. So just like any other company, you've got to figure out, well, what what domicile now I, I'm, uh, you know, we're based in the US. So some of this domicile might mean, well, which state are you choosing from? If you're in Canada, what, what province? Um, <clears throat> so that'll differ between what, what country you're in or what legal structure is available for creating a corporation. So you got to choose your domicile. What, what do you want to be in? And there's lots of different choices and lots of different aspects around domicile that could be anonymity, um, taxation of the corporation. There's a lot of different aspects to think about where you're going to be. Um, you've got to have an operating agreement for your manager. <clears throat> this operating agreement doesn't just list who the partners of your manager that we talked about your team earlier. It's also going through and all of how things will work between the groups, who's responsible, legal meanings. Um, do you have arbitration clauses? I, I mean, it'll walk through all the moving pieces of the manager as a business. Now, if that's something you don't have knowledge of and you haven't done that before well then that's that's something where you're going to have to go to legal counsel and say hey i need to build this company maybe it's an llc or an lp um and you got to work with legal to kind of think about hey what's the best operating agreement i can put in place because some of that may involve actual engagement and process and procedure with regards to employees could be embedded in that operating agreement um and then like i just right there proper regulatory structure and filings you're in the investment world you're a manager. Well, depending on how you structure yourself, you might actually have to file that manager. Um, depending on if you're giving any kind of investment advice, you might have to go file with your state uh, or the SEC itself, uh, depending on you know the assets under management, you're going to have to walk through and think about, okay, well, who do I have to file with and how do I have to maintain that? And there again, if you don't know how to do that, um, the lawyer you want to work with well, hopefully they have that expertise to help you with that filing as the manager. Um, so, for instance, here I'm in Washington. If I had to file with the state because I'm giving some level of investment advice or I'm running an equity based fund, I would have to file with the Washington State Department of Financial Institutions. Um, so, I mean, just as an example, um, physical structures, offices, well, that was never really a question in the past. It was always like, well, everyone's going to have an office. Well, that's not necessarily the case anymore. 
um, you can run many, many things on a very virtual basis. Uh, a lot of aspects of funds that I've run have been incredibly virtual. Um, if you are heavy in marketing or you have a large team and there's a lot of cross collaboration, well, then you might need to have an office to make sure you're maximizing the benefit of that. Um, but it is a choice now of in today's world, well, if I'm going to run a small fund, do I really need the cost of an office? Um, something to think about. Um, and then software platforms. Uh, there are a ton of different software platforms that you will need to consider as the, as, you know, as the manager uh, to meet a variety of different requirements of being an investment manager. Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a long list depending on some of them we'll cover, but I'm not going to cover all of them in this uh, conversation. Uh, we're not here to build a fund today. We're here to just kind of talk about what to think about as we're going down this road. Um, and then I did separate out this se second piece. Um, legal formation is one aspect and then regulatory filing and compliance is more due to like, well, if I'm that investment advisor, do I need to, you know, which state do I need to file with? Or if I'm running over 150 million, do I file directly with the SEC? Uh, it's one of the considerations you'll have to have depending on how big your fund starts. Um, and then personnel we talked about, um, get your backgrounds, get your previous jobs, get your skills listed. Um, these are the, that, that team that we talked about earlier, this is where they sit. This is the entity they work for. They work for the manager. Um, a lot of people are mistaken. There's no employees at the fund level. The fund is a separate company that we'll talk about, but all your employees and all the functionality sits at the manager level. Um, service providers got to set up a bank account there again, if you didn't have the knowledge of how to create your own operating, operating agreements or filings, well, you're going to have to have legal. You got to go find legal that's going to support that. And then you probably won't have the uh, manager audited, but you will need tax. You're running a business. You're going to have to file your taxes. Maybe you have a state tax. Uh, obviously, you'll have to file federal. Um, so there's everything that goes into running any other business is sitting at this manager level. And if you are bringing historical returns, OK, well, then, you know, double check with legal. Uh, make sure it's something that's comparable and you can showcase it because um, you can't get yourself in trouble by, you know, going out and touting returns of one thing that has nothing to do with uh, what you're bringing forward in your fund. Now, let's just make an assumption that um, your historical returns were of the in, uh, of the investment and the uh, strategy that you're going to be deploying in this fund. Well, that's great. You can now bring that historical track record. Uh, with certain disclosures and disclaimers um, to this fund as a historical look at, hey, when I was out maybe doing this as, uh, let's use individual syndications in real estate as, a, as an example. Well, here's my returns within these individual trades and shows that I have some level of success. And now I'm going to go basket this up into a fund and bring a series of these real estate trades, whatever they might be, into one entity, this fund. Um, that's, that's completely acceptable. Um, but one of the things you need to be careful of is if you're out there marketing and you're showcasing, you got to make sure that you're showcasing, you know, uh, correct information with the proper disclaimers. And so we'll talk a little bit about that's one of the challenges of going into the fund world is there are rules of what you can and can't show and you can get yourself in trouble. So let's not do that. Um, so now that we've kind of walked through and built uh, the first entity, the manager, well, let's dive into what we're actually talking about. Let's go to the next slide and let's build a fund. Um, all right. So this is the second entity. This is the entity that will have legal ownership to the investments. It will be that all encompassing uh, platform that is running, you know, holding the investors dollars and running the investments. And the manager will have an agreement with the uh, fund for its management. And that'll show up in a couple different places. It'll probably show up in the operating agreement of the manager. It'll show up in if you have an actual investment management agreement in place. Um, and it'll show up in what we have here, legal formations. Um, here again, you got to pick a domicile. Where is the fund going to be located? Um, there again, you know, a lot of people go pick Delaware. Not saying that's right or wrong. It just happens to be where a lot of people go build um, their fund structures. Um, and then you've got an operating agreement. OK, just like you had for the manager, this operating agreement is the operating agreement or sometimes people will call it an LLC agreement or an LP agreement, depending on the, the structure that you've built for your fund. 
and that will list out all the operating functions and procedures for this entity. Um, and then you have to think about, like we just said there, uh, is there any other filings that you need for state and federal? That's where legal will come in. They can help you file your Reg D. They can help you file a number of different things that will be in place to make sure that you're compliant with the regulators, whether that be state or federal. Um, <clears throat> and like I said, we're not going to dive into this. This get That goes down a whole rabbit hole that we don't have time for. Um, and there's a lot of ways to think about that. And it's dependent on, you know, your investment. Um, service providers. Okay, well, this gets a little bit more complex. Um, depending on what your investment is, well, and this, if you want to build a bigger fund, uh, post-2008, we ran into a situation where previous to um, 2008, the great financial crisis, um, a lot of people were actually having self-administered funds. Um, so they ran internal accounting and that ran into a lot of problems, caused some issues um, for a lot of different funds uh, around 2008, 2009. So the general premise post, to, post that time period, and this is not a law, this is just how things kind of unraveled and what people want to see in their due diligence process is a third party administrator. So one of the things you got to think about is going in and saying, hey, I'm going to build this fund. I want to build to a certain size and I know that's a requirement. Um, I'm going to have this third party administrator. Um, I have run into people that really view this administrator is their CFO. That is just wrong. Um, the administrator runs middle and back office accounting functionality, sometimes AML, KYC. Um, if people who are not aware of that, that's anti-money laundering and know your client functions. So that's what your administrator is doing. Now, some of them will branch out into other structures uh, and provide different services to your fund, but that's the core of what an administrator is doing. Is there that third party looking over your shoulder with regards to middle and back office accounting? Um, they'll help with you know onboarding. A lot of administrators will have an investment portal that your investors can use to invest into your fund. So um, like I said, um, you can use all of their functionality or you can use very little, but it's something if you have the idea that, hey, I'm gonna grow this fund and I wanna be of size. In a post 2008 world, you're probably gonna have to have a fund administrator. Um, and you just gotta understand what they really are and what they aren't. Um, and I have run into people who really think that well, I, maybe I don't even need to manage my fund. Um, these guys are going to handle all my investors. They're going to handle all my accounting. Um, you're going to get yourself in trouble if that's your mentality. Um, they are not part of your company. They're a third party service provider. You're responsible for your company, i.e. the fund. Uh, and at the end of the day, if something goes wrong um, from an investment standpoint, they will carry no liability. It will be all on you. So you need to be, you know, have your eye on the prize, you know, thumb on the heartbeat. Next is... Um, you got to have a bank. Um, if you're trading a hedge fund and you're going to be buying market securities, let's just use a simple example. I'm going to be long short uh, a number of different uh, securities. Then I'm going to have to have some kind of prime broker that's going to act as custodian of those. Um, if I'm shorting stock, I'm going to have to obtain some kind of borrow or something of that to maintain those shorts. That's the complete function of a prime broker. If you're not doing any of that, well, then you won't need a prime broker, um, you know, for like my real estate debt fund. You know, we, we, don't, we don't have prime brokerage. I'm not dealing with actual marketable securities, uh, nor am I shorting anything. Um, if you do have something that's not marketable and it still needs to be custodied, um, you might need a custodian. Um, here again, you've got a legal provider. Um, and depending on your trade, the legal provider can help you set up the fund, can help you deal with regulations. But maybe your trade requires some esoteric legal structure you need access to lawyers who have a particular niche or special special um network for you to carry your trade off um i know a couple of trades like that um you know there you could actually sort of label them almost as legal arbitrage because the lawyers are extremely important in pulling off some of these trades um here again tax um audit is not always required um but if you're looking to you know be a sizable fund and access large platforms of potential investors, most of them will require you to be audited. So you have to go out and find um, a provider that uh, will both, uh, you know, you'll have tax because um, you've got to be able to prepare your 1099s or your K1s for your investors, depending on the structure of your fund. And you'll have to be audited um, depending on, like I said earlier, what your aspirations are for your fund. 
<clears throat> and then any other unique service providers. Um, there's so many different trades out there. Um, and a lot of times you will need certain people with certain networks to help you complete your trade. And so those are something that you're going to have to list out and understand that as, you know, a service provider. Um, we got some more slides on building funds. The, the fun part is a little bit more complicated. Let's uh, jump to the next slide. So um, now you got to think about, you know, standard operating procedures, you know, your SOPs. And some of this will be embodied in, um, you know, under documentation, you'll see their process and procedures manual. Um, one of the things in higher levels of due diligence, if you're going to go out and pull money from large institutions, endowments, sovereign, uh, sovereign wealth, something of that nature, they may be extremely thorough in their due diligence. Um, and one of the things that they're going to want to see is, well, what are these process and procedures across everything within your fund? How does everything work? How does it all get done? What are the safety protocols? You've got, you know, business continuity plans. I mean, you've got so many different things in today's cybersecurity issues now. Um, they're going to want to see all this. You're going to have to think about all this and build all of this for your fund. Um, and that's something that's, uh, like I said, it's an ongoing monitoring aspect to build a fund. You've got to really be on it and understand what's changing in the dynamic world to make sure that you can keep investors safe and that you can get new investors. Um, you know, and then one of the things I mentioned here is investor reporting. Um, how often are you commun communicating and how are you communicating with, uh, with investors? And there's no right or wrong. Um, it's just you got to think about if you go dark and your investors have no idea what you're doing, whether you're doing well or not, that's going to cause a problem. In today's world of where information is readily available and people need to like to know immediately what's going on, you're going to have to create some level of transparency and think about that procedure of, well, how am I communicating with my investors to ensure and maximizing transparency? So that's uh, it's it, and that's no small task. There's a lot of work that goes into that. And like I was saying earlier, as people come into this fund world and they think, hey, I'm just going to run these investments and it's going to be on this fund and that's all I have to do. Well, you're gravely mistaken. There's actually a great deal of work it takes to be in a fund structure and bring in investors dollars and manage this correctly without getting into too much trouble um you guys can read through the software there's that's a small list uh of what you might need uh for a fund um those are some of the bigger ones um that you're gonna have to think about with regards to and some of that all links back to reporting to investors um you know and 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 safety of capital things like that. Um, tons of different software in today's age. Now, software is important also because it increases efficiency. So you want to run a business and you want to be as efficient as possible. You got to think, well, how do I have the not only the right people, but the right software to make sure that um, I can be as efficient as possible? And like I said earlier, when we were going through in one of my first intros into how funds were built, was we went around and looked at the efficiency of operations uh, of what they were already trading. I mean, they already had an investment objective in these funds that we were tearing apart. We now needed to go, was there a better way to make it more efficient for this team to carry out that investment, <clears throat> both in a safety process and a cost standpoint? So software is a very big deal in today's age. Um, it'll also allow you to better capture that leverageability of a fund. So you can go raise an extra $10 million. Well, you might need to hire five people. You can buy or one if you've got efficiency of process and you've got the right software in place um, to help you carry that out. So that's one of the advantages of, of being in a fund. Then all the documentations. All right. Um, private placement memorandum, uh, or sometimes people will call it an offering memorandum. This is the legal document that walks through every nuance of what you're doing from an investment standpoint and how that will be transacted um, for the investor. Uh, it goes hand in hand with that operating agreement we talked about in the other slide. Those are two documents you're going to have to send out when the investor is ready and have them read through those, really understand that and be available to answer questions on these PPMs and OAs. Um, it's an important step for the investor to learn not only what you're doing, but how you're gonna do it and how 
and what rights they sometimes have as an investor and what happens if like, oh, we got a key man issue. If anyone doesn't know what a key man issue is, let's say we've got a small fund, one person's running the whole thing. That guy gets hit by the proverbial bus. The PPM will walk through, well, what happens? The guy who was basically running all the investments is no longer here. What is the process and procedure for investors to understand about the continuation of that fund or the wind down of that fund? Um, so give you a kind of one, one of the things that's in the PPM. Some of these documents can be anywhere from 50 to I think the biggest one I've seen was about 150 pages. Um, so it's a big legal document there. Again, you're going to probably need some help from legal to help you draft these documents and make sure that it reads correctly so that you can, you know, there again, meet your objective through the strategy that we discussed earlier. Um, FAQs, frequently asked questions. Um, I think this is kind of a joke because I send out an FAQ to investors and then they turn around and ask the questions that are on the FAQ. So just get ready for that. Um, you'll, you'll prepare things. You got to have things ready because uh, some people will read them, but don't be surprised when some people don't. Um, your marketing deck um, that comes in lots of different forms today. Um, you know, you're going to have to create a marketing deck so you can tell people in a uh, in a graphical way and help in a presentation about what are we doing? Term sheet. Term sheet is a, a one or a two page, preferably one page um, document that is a quick synopsis of your entire fund and all the important information in one sheet. I know that sounds really hard because it is um, in one sheet to say, hey, this is what we're doing. And here's sort of a quick snapshot. And if you're interested, I can send you more information. Um, a DDQ is a due diligence questionnaire. Um, here again, not needed for every fund, but if you plan on moving on and dealing with larger investors who have more thorough due diligence programs, you're probably going to need this deck, uh, this uh, the DDQ. Um, and it really is a walkthrough of the entire operational procedures through sort of a question and answer format, uh, supplying information to a would-be investor uh, about how the operations and the investment strategy all link together. Um, and then uh, for bigger organizations, a compliance manual. Um, in today's age, here again, not every organization, not every fund has to have one. Um, but if you have aspirations of grandeur, of I'm going to build uh, a very large fund, you're probably going to have to hire uh, either an internal or an external compliance team, which will actually maintain and operate a code of ethics and a compliance manual for your company. Um, to ensure that everybody, uh, yourself included, and all your employees, everyone at the manager is operating under a compliant and ethical manner within the securities realm. Um, and then we already talked about process and procedures. So you can get an idea. This is a lot of moving pieces, and we haven't even come to what I think is the hardest section of building a fund. So let's jump to the next slide. Yeah, investors. Um, I know I said this earlier, um, and I will say this again, anyone who's been around me long enough, I think the hardest part of building a fund is ensuring you have the investors. So if you're very fortunate to already have a base of investors, well, congratulations. Um, that doesn't always happen for everyone. A lot of people have a really great investment idea and they've never gone out and raised uh, investors um, in a format that's a fund. Um, <clears throat> and that can be challenging in unique ways, even if you've raised money for a one-off investment or you've raised friends and family money. Um, it, 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 there's new challenges when it comes to a fund. And I'll, some of it's purely psychology. Um, the psychological impact of, in today's age, unfortunately, there's been a number of funds that um, you know didn't do right. And what we had was now that one apple has kind of soured the cart for a lot of other people who are trying to run completely legitimate funds. And they've created this anxiety around like, oh, my God, is this fund a fraud? Um, and that psychology is an overwhelming aspect of, hey, we're going to go build a fund. Um, you'll get a lot of investors. They will go to the nth degree to understand how many safety procedures you have in place. So it's something you got to be ready for. So, But let's walk through some of the investors. Um, your money. You're going to start a fund. How much money do you have? How much skin in the game do you have? It's something that's very important. A lot of investors want to see it. They want to understand that this is an investment so great that you've put your own money here. Um, and, you know, I actually had one person said, oh, I don't really have much money in my fund. I'm uh, Most of my money's over here. And I asked him this one simple question. I said, well, 
Well, then what's that investment? Because that's clearly better than what you're offering me here, because that's where most of your money is. Um, I say that tongue in cheek, but I was serious with this guy. I was like, well, why did you put all your money in X, Y, Z? And now you're offering me a different product. Um, so have that skin in the game. Um, it's one of those things that maybe you need to bootstrap. I mean, I've dealt with funds and I've built funds that I had to bootstrap from zero. We, we lost an anchor. We didn't have initial investors and we had to write our own checks and just get started. Um, and maybe it's just your money. Um, and now you're in true startup mode. You know, just like you hear all these tech startups. Well, you can be in startup mode for a fund as well because um, there's no big money coming in day one. You've got to build it yourself on your own dime. Um, so, but regardless of that scenario, how much money do you have in skin in the game is important to investors. If you can find and you have a network for what they call an anchor investor, um, it's important to consider. Um, if you don't have one, it's okay. Um, I've had anchor investors and I've lost anchor investors due to, you know, we just lost one last fund I was building. You know, COVID came around. We launched a fund in January of 2020. And well, let's just say it's hard to get people's money in March of 2020. So, um, but an anchor investor is someone who believes in your investment uh, objective and strategy, wants to participate in it. Um, they will write you a, a, a sizable check. Um, now, sizable means a, a lot of different things. Maybe that's 500,000, maybe it's 50 million, um, depending on where you are in the lifespan of building a fund. Um, but that person often not will have special treatment, maybe depending on their strategy, they may have discounted fees or liquidity preferences. There's a number of things they can ask for because obviously they're helping build your business like they want. So um, next is kind of friends and family. Are we thinking about like, OK, well, who else do I know out there that would benefit from this investment I'm bringing in this fund that I'm creating? Um, you know, often not. You sometimes have a larger base uh, and network of investors than you realize simply through friends and family. Um, and sometimes that works out, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and then what is your assessed network? I mean, these are things that you got to think about before you get into this, because you don't want to go pay legal fees and build an entire fund and a manager and all this different stuff. And now we don't have any money. And I have no idea where I'm even going to get money. You know, what is your network? Do you have networks with high net worth? Do you have family offices? Is your investment in your fund far enough along to maybe approach larger investors like RIAs and bigger institutions? Um, map that out. Think about it. This is the lifeblood of what you're about to create. Without investors and money, it's a tough road uh, to build a fund. You know, And then think about marketing. Where am I going to be marketing? Um, there's so many different options in today's world. You know, am I going to, you know, use LinkedIn? What's my what's my social media aspect? You know, am I cold calling? Am I sending out physical mail? How, how am I doing this? You know, think about that and build that before you, you know, go forward. And then there's a group of third party marketers. There's a people out there that are basically licensed and paid to help you raise money. Um, and, you know, Finding the right one can be difficult because not everybody raises money for maybe the investment strategy you're bringing to call. So I will state again, this may be one of the last slides of the fund, but it's extremely important. It's the lifeblood of what you're thinking about building. And you got to put a lot of thought into where are these investors coming from and how am I going to continue to build them? And on the back end of that is, well, well and one of the things we didn't really talk about is what's the capacity of my fund? It's like, maybe I have a very niche trade and I can't manage more than 50 million. Okay, well then know that. Think about that up front and, and work it into your strategy, your objective, your investor and marketing plan. I mean, think about that. Um, maybe you have endless, hey, I'm going to trade foreign currency. I can run billions and really not, you know, impact anything. Maybe that's the situation. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very depending on what you're going to create but think about it ahead of time and, you know, well, how am I going to go out and get these investors? So um, raising money is very difficult. And here again, I'll reiterate, it can be a full-time job. So now that you have a full-time job of running the investments, you have another job of running this fund and this manager, you now have another job of I've got to go raise money. So you can get the idea. Don't take this go build a fund lightly. Um, it, it is a lot of work. It can be very rewarding but it is no shortage of work. Um, so let's move on to next slide. All right, 
here we go. Challenges and opportunities. Now, there are a ton. I'm not going to list 50 bullet points on either side um, because they are going to be different uh, based on the number of different things that we talked about today. But some of the overlying stuff, and I've already mentioned some of this, is some of the challenges. It's a second job, sometimes multiple second jobs. You know, it's, you know, to carry out this investment, you, you, get, you got to run a, multiple companies. You got to, you know, you got to have a whole team that you're managing that maybe oversees these companies. Maybe you have a lack of knowledge. Maybe this is something you're listening to this and you're like, hey, well, OK, I, I now have something to think about. Um, build a network. Go find resources to help educate yourself on all the things that I've kind of talked about, because we this is a hundred thousand foot level that we kind of hit today. This goes uh, you know, much, much deeper when you really start thinking about how am I going to do this? Um, you know, go talk to lawyers, but don't engage them yet. Try to get as much information as you can uh, about what you're trying to build and, and, and walk out the first 10 steps of this journey um, you know, for no money. So you can make sure, do I really want to continue down this path or not? Um, but you got you to gotta fill that knowledge gap um, if you've never done this before. Um, regulatory requirements and potential fines. As I, you know, I mentioned, you know, uh, I, one of my friends works in um, the uh, examination aspect, which is the people you never want to see on your doorstep for regulators. They show up when you've made a mistake or they're there to do a review because they think you've done something wrong. Um, and, you know, one of the classic things they see in a lot of different, you know, managers is, they went out and said something incorrect with their performance or, you know, silliness and used the word guaranteed or something like that. And now they've got themselves in trouble or there's a misrepresentation to investors. You could, you know, be, you know, you know have your, you know, exemptions revoked. You could, you know, have a license removed. You could have a lot of fines. There's lots of things to think about. There are risks to doing this business. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people looking over your shoulder and they're not there to tell you how to do it right. They're only kind of there to make sure you, you know, you, you pay the piper when you made a mistake. Um, so don't think that the regulators are going to come in there and hold your hand and make sure you're doing it right. You know, they'll give you instructional, you know, information to get started, but you're going to have to keep up on that knowledge curve, like I said, to make sure you're doing things right and make sure your employees are doing right. So that goes back to that kind of code of ethics and compliance and proce procedures structure so that when you hire someone to go put performance together or put a marketing piece together, they're doing it correctly and not going to get you in trouble. Um, and then, like we just said, I think one of the biggest challenges of running a fund is raising the money. Um, you know, Maybe you're luckier than me and many others. You have a source of endless money. You found the leprechaun at the end of the rainbow and you're good to go. Um, kudos. But for most people, uh, raising money will be a, a endless and tireless job of running a fund. Um, you'll always find yourself raising money. Um, you'll probably hear other people say that as well, regardless of whether you're a venture, hedge fund, real estate. You know, If you have a repeatable process, you're going to be raising money for a while. Now, the opportunities. Um, it's a streamlined entity to manage multiple potential investments. So like maybe you've gone off and you've done these one-offs. Now you will have a platform to where 20, 30, 50, 100 of these one-off trades could be all in one basket. Um, and what that can create is, you know, we'll jump to the third point there, the economies of scale, where you've created now an investment vehicle for people to participate and maybe get some get this you know your esoteric inefficient trade in a cost efficient manner run by a professional team um that has all the ducks in a row i mean that's 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 what everyone's looking for that's what they want to see is that repeatable that consistency that safety <coughs> excuse me of capital um and while they're capturing some type of excess return um now as a business you can build a track record uh, and a legacy of, you know, in venture, you know, you see them start one fund, you know, I don't think a single venture person I've ever run into has a vision of I'm only going to create one fund. They have a whole view of where they're going to create a series of funds due to the nature of how venture and startups work. Um, and they, you know, maybe they'll end their career on their 13th, 14th, 15th fund, who knows, but you can create that legacy that 
you can carry success forward um, over multiple different platforms. Um, and last little point there, you can see, you know, successful once, well, it increases the probability of you being successful again. Um, and so it definitely makes everything we've talked about easier as you build success in your first fund and you have views of other vehicles that you want to bring um, that will make your next steps easier. So um, I think we can jump to the last slide here, which is really just, you know, questions and answers. I want to thank everybody again. <coughs> Excuse me, a little congested. Um, Tis the season of cold weather. But um, I really want to thank everybody for if you made this call or if you're watching this, you know, later, thank you for taking the time. And if there's any other questions, we can dive into whatever you want to discuss. Yes. And there's uh, in the chat there, there's my email. Feel free. Drop me an email. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, there's not too many Chris Carsley's in the world. Uh, I know it doesn't sound like a rare name, but it is relatively rare. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, connect with me. Um, just be sure to put a note in there and saying, hey, listen to the webinar. Love to connect and talk further about building funds. We'd love to talk to you. Yep, absolutely. So um, I just made sure to put that email there in the comments. That way you guys can refer back to it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take this down. Chris, we do have, and if there are any more questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We do have uh, one more as of right now. Should you have a securities license to solicit to investors? It depends on the structure of your fund. Um, generally, the answer to that is yes, depending on um, if you're running a private investment um, and you are a partner for that manager representing the private investment, <clears throat> you don't actually have to be licensed um, to go out and issue that private placement memorandum, as long as you have the correct disclaimers within your marketing pitch. Um, I know that's a convoluted answer, um, but it, it your question is a little loaded. Um, it, it can be complicated, but let's use a scenario of I'm going to go be a third party marketer. <clears throat> yes, if I'm going to go solicit someone else's product. Um, I need to be licensed for multiple reasons. Um, so yes, do not go out and pitch and expect to be paid and not get in trouble. Um, you need to be have a security license for selling product. Um, but there is a mechanism as being a partner within a fund offering a private investment. Um, and let's say, I know this is getting down the weeds. Um, let's say we're going to go do... Uh, our exemption uh, is, you know, a 506B. Um, we can go out and solicit up to 35 non-accredited investors and all the other investors have to be accredited. And there's certain requirements of soliciting non-accredited investors and there's certain information that has to be obtained. Um, and just like accredited, you've got to get an accredited verification letter these days. So you've got, you know, there's, there's multiple nuances that go into going out and soliciting uh, an investment. But in general, if you're running a fund and it's a private issuance and you've got all your exemptions in place, then you won't actually have to have a securities license. But if all that doesn't exist, yes, you should be licensed if you're going to be uh, soliciting any investment. Great. Great question. Um, and, and I think that's it for the question. So, Chris, thank you again. You know, we really appreciate you coming on. Really great presentation. I, I uh I really enjoyed that myself personally, and I know I'm sure a lot of our viewers did as well. So I um, just want to say thank you again. And to everybody else, thank you guys for being on here. wanted to wish everyone um, Happy New Year's and best of luck for everybody going into 2023, investing and, and <laughs> what have you. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you again, Chris. Yeah, no, thank you. And everyone, um, good luck in building your fund if that's what you choose you're going to do. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, everybody take care. Happy Tuesday. Cheers. Bye.